thank you all. A theme of this conference has been the future of JavaScript, but I want to take a step back and look at the future of the browser as a whole. But first, let me introduce myself. I am Lynn Clark, and I make code cartoons. And I also work at Mozilla, where I'm in the Emerging Technologies group. So that's things like the Rust programming language and WebAssembly, which is a fast way to run code that's not JavaScript in the browser. We also work on Servo, which is a new web engine. And I'll be talking about all of these things today, because they're all a part of the future of the browser. So why talk about the future of the browser? Because browsers are facing a challenge. And whether or not browsers meet this challenge could change the web as we know it. So what is this challenge? The browser needs to get faster. As Rachel talked about this morning, content on the web has changed since the early days. In the early days of the web, speed really didn't matter that much. We were just looking at static documents. So as soon as you downloaded that document and it was rendered to the screen, the browser was pretty much done. It might have a little bit more work to do if you scrolled or something like that, but there was nothing too complicated. Then people started pushing the boundaries. They started thinking, what can we do with this web besides just serving static documents? Pages started getting interactive and started having animations. Like, do you remember when everybody went wild for drop downs and you had these animated jQuery things going up and down? Once those were on the page, the web page wasn't just being painted once in the browser. It was being painted multiple times. For that motion to look smooth, you had to be painting at a certain rate. You had to be painting 60 times per second. So this meant that you only had 16 milliseconds to actually figure out what had changed. The browser only had 16 milliseconds to figure out what changed between the last version of the page and the next version. Browsers made all sorts of changes to come up to speed, to accommodate these new applications and get up to 60 frames per second. But as is the way with the web, content authors started pushing things further. They started not just making their web applications more interactive, but bringing whole new classes of applications to the web. So things like PC games. And companies started talking about bringing their applications to the web, things like Photoshop. These new classes of applications are pushing the web even further. They're taxing the web. And they're making it clear that things like JavaScript need to get faster. But it's not just content authors that are pushing the boundaries of the web. It's also the hardware vendors. For example, the new iPad is going from 60 frames per second to 120 frames per second. So that means that you have half as much time to do just as much work. And there are new kinds of content coming to the web that are pushing this further. For example, with VR, you have two different displays, one for each eye, and each of these has to be going at at least 90 frames per second to avoid motion sickness. And each of these displays could be up to 4K resolution, which is a lot more pixels that you have to display. So let's think about what this change means. If we're running a website on a MacBook Pro 13 inch, we have 16 milliseconds to fill in about 4 million pixels. On an iPad, you have 8 milliseconds, half as much time to fill in about 3 million pixels. With a VR experience, we're looking at 11 milliseconds to fill in 16.5 million pixels. And that, that's not even including any additional JavaScript, heavier application JavaScript needs that these applications have. That is a huge leap that browsers need to make. What happens if the browsers don't keep up? Well, as more and more people buy these new devices, and as more and more content moves to these heavier applications, if browsers don't keep up, it could mean that people don't see the web as the default place to put their content. And that could mean that the web as we know it withers, which is a pretty scary thought. But to be honest, I'm not too worried. I'm confident that browsers can make this leap. The reason that I'm confident about this is because at Mozilla, We've been planning for this for the past 10 years. We've been looking at the direction that computer hardware is going, and we've been figuring out the new way that we need to program in order to keep up with these changes. The answer is parallelism. The future of the browser is parallel. We've only just started taking advantage of this in Firefox, but we're already seeing some really big wins from it. And every indication is that this new way of programming is going to get us where we need to go. 
So in this talk, I want to explain exactly what it is that browsers need to change in order to keep up with these changes. But before I do that, let's talk a little bit about how the browser works. I'm going to start with the rendering engine, which is the most important part of the browser. It takes your HTML and CSS and turns it into the pixels that you see on the screen. So it does this in five steps, but I can make this simpler because we can group these into two different groups. The first group takes the HTML and CSS and figures out a plan. It figures out where everything should go. It's kind of like a blueprint. And it specifies things like widths and heights and colors of all of the different elements. The second group takes that plan and turns it into the pixels that you see on the screen. Now let's look more closely at each of these steps. The first step is called parsing. And what the parser does is it takes the HTML that you've downloaded and turns it into something that the browser can understand. Because the HTML, when it comes in, is just basically like a big paper ribbon with one long string of HTML on it. And we need to turn it into something that the browser can actually use, a data structure that will tell us what the different elements on the page are and what their relationships are to each other. So I think of this kind of like a family tree. And what the parser does is it goes along this paper ribbon and with a pair of scissors, basically. And it sees an opening tag for an HTML element. It's going to cut that out and put it into the family tree. So let's say it comes across a div. It'll put that into the family tree. And the next thing it comes across is a paragraph tag. It will put that under the div in this family tree and then draw a line connecting them to signify that parent-child relationship. This family tree is called the DOM tree, or the document object model. And the reason it's called that is because it gives you a model of the document that you can use to make changes. So if JavaScript wanted to make a change, let's say that we didn't want to show some of these paragraphs, we could change this family tree, we could remove some of those paragraphs, and then they wouldn't show up on the screen anymore. So at the end of parsing, we have this family tree, this DOM tree. And that tells us about the structure of the page and the parent-child relationships, but it doesn't tell us anything about what they should look like. In order to figure out what these elements should look like, we need to take the CSS that we've downloaded and figure out which of the styles apply to which of the elements. So that's the next step, CSS style computation. I think of CSS style computation like a person filling in a form for each one of these elements in the tree. And that form is going to say exactly what this element should look like. And it has more than 200 form fields on it. It has one form field for each CSS property. And every form needs to be filled out completely. So for every element in the DOM, it needs to figure out exactly the value for each of those form fields. At the end of CSS style computation, we have one of these forms on each of these elements in the tree. But there's still a little bit more that we need to figure out. We need to figure out how wide and how high all of these elements are and where they're going to be on the page. The next step, layout, takes care of this. It looks at the dimensions of the browser window, and from that, it figures out these relative things, like if that div was 50% of its parent, what exactly that means. And we'll also do things like break up the paragraph into how many lines it's going to be, so it knows how high that containing div needs to be. So the output of this step is another tree. In Firefox, we call this the frame tree, but in other browsers, it's called the render tree or the box tree, and this is that ultimate plan. This is what tells us exactly what our page needs to look like. So now we can move on to the next part of rendering, which is turning that page into pixels, that plan into pixels. Filling in pixels can take a long time, especially when you have a lot of things changing. So because of this, browsers have tried to reduce the amount of work that they have to do and uh, do it quicker. And one way that they've done this is by splitting it up into multiple layers. So you can think of these like the layers that you have in Photoshop, or I think of them like the old-timey animation onion skin layers, like they would have used for something like Bugs Bunny. You have a background on one layer, and then you have characters on another layer. So if the characters move, you don't actually need to repaint that background layer. You only need to repaint the layer that has the moving thing on it. So the first step in this process is called painting. That's where you actually paint those layers. And the next step is called compositing. That's where you put these layers together, and then you basically just take a picture of it and put that on the screen. So that's how the page gets rendered. Now, I frame this as the way that a web page's content goes from HTML and CSS to pixels. But what you may not know is that there's actually another part of the browser, the URL bar, the tabs, the scroll bar. 
that part's actually separate. It's called the browser Chrome. And in browsers such as Firefox, rendering browser Chrome is also handled by the rendering engine. So you have this rendering engine, and it has multiple things that it needs to do. It has to render the inside of this window, which is called the content, and the outside, the stuff around it, which is the browser Chrome. And actually, it's not even just two tasks. Because for any tab that you have open, there's going to be another content window. Even if its pixels aren't showing because it's not the selected tab, it could still be doing JavaScript in the background. So the browser has multiple things to do. And they're all pretty independent of each other. This is actually one of the first places where you saw parallelism in the browser. In 2008, you started seeing a browser taking advantage of new hardware to run these things independently of each other. But it wasn't us that did that. It was Chrome. When Chrome launched, its architecture was already using parallelism like this. It's called the multi-process architecture. And that's why Chrome was faster. It's one of the reasons why Chrome was faster and more responsive than Firefox at that time. Now, I feel like I should take a step back and explain exactly what that all means, what hardware change specifically Chrome was taking advantage of, and what that change made possible. So let's take a little bit of a crash course in computers and how they work. You can think of a computer kind of like you think of a brain. There are different parts of this brain. There's the part that does the thinking, so that's addition, subtraction, any logical operations like and or or. And then there's some short-term memory. And grouped together, they're pretty close in the same part of this brain. And then there's long-term memory. Now, these different parts have names. So the part that does the thinking, that's called the arithmetic and logic unit. And the short-term memory, those are called registers. And they're grouped together on the central processing unit, or CPU. And then this longer-term memory is called RAM, random access memory. Now, to get this brain to actually do anything, we need to give it an instruction. This instruction is going to tell us what we need to do with some bit of the short-term memory. Each box of short-term memory has a label so that we can actually use it in the instruction. So we could say we need to add the number 1 to whatever value is in R4. Now, one thing that you might have figured out from this is that we can only do one thing at a time. This brain can only think one thought at a time. And that was really true of most computers, from the earliest computers until the mid-2000s. But even though these computers had that limitation for years, they were still getting faster. Every 18 months to two years, they were getting twice as fast. You could get twice as many instructions done in the same amount of time. What made it possible for these computers to get faster was something called Moore's Law. The little electrical circuits that you used to build all of these different parts of the CPU, they were getting smaller and smaller, which meant that you could fit more and more of them on a single chip. With more of these building blocks, you can make more and more powerful parts on your CPU. And also, that means there's less distance between the circuits so they can work together faster. But of course, you can only make things so small, and there's only so much electricity that you can course through a circuit before it starts burning up. In the early 2000s, these limitations were starting to become apparent. Chip manufacturers had to think, if they wanted to have faster and faster chips, how could they do it? The answer that they came up with was splitting up this chip into multiple brains, basically making it possible to think more than one thought at a time in parallel. These separate brains that the CPU has are called cores. When you hear people talking about a multi-core architecture, this is what they're talking about. Even though each one of these cores or brains is limited in how fast it can think, if you add more of them, they can do more in the same amount of time. But the thing is, in order to take advantage of this, you need to be able to split up the work that you have to do across these different brains. Unlike before, where the speedups were happening automatically without programmers having to do anything, in order to take advantage of this, programmers need to change the way that they code. This is actually harder to do than you might think. So imagine that two of these cores need to work on the same bit of long-term memory. They both need to add something to it. What's the result going to be at the end of these two calculations? Who knows? It depends on the order that the instructions happen on the different cores. So let's walk through an example of this. We're going to start with the number 8 in long-term memory. And each of the cores is going to add 1 to it so that the end result should be 10. Now, instructions have to use things that are in short-term memory. And each core has its own short-term memory. 
So the first core is going to pull 8 into its short-term memory so that it can work with it. And then it's going to add 1 to get 9 and put that back into long-term memory. And this means that the other core can now access the results of that calculation. So long-term memory holds 9 now. The second core pulls 9 from long-term memory into short-term memory, adds 1 to get 10, and puts the 10 back in long-term memory. So our result is 10. All is well with the world. But it wasn't guaranteed to end up this way. Let's see what happens when the instructions happen in a different order. The first core pulls 8 from long-term memory, and then the second core pulls 8 from long-term memory. And you may already see the problem here. The four, first core adds 1 to get 9, and then writes that back to long-term memory. The second core adds 1 to get 9, and then writes that back to long-term memory. And so our end result is 9, which is not what we wanted. This kind of bug is called a data race. When you have parallel code with shared memory, so two cores working with the same bit of long-term memory at the same time, you're very likely to have these data races. One way to get around this is to choose tasks that are pretty independent of each other so that they don't need to share memory. Now let's go back to the Chrome and the content example that I was showing you before. You might remember I said that these tasks were all pretty independent of each other. That means that they're perfect for this kind of parallelism where you don't need to share memory between them. And that's called coarse-grained parallelism. That's where you split up your program into some pretty large tasks that you can be doing independently of each other, but at the same time. It's actually pretty straightforward to do this. You just need to figure out those coarse grains, those large independent tasks. So Chrome had this from the beginning. The Chrome engineers saw that they were going to need to have some level of parallelism to be fast with these new architectures. Around the same time that Chrome was seeing this change in hardware and seeing that if they wanted to have a fast browser, they're going to need to take advantage of this parallelism, we were seeing the same thing. We knew that if we were going to have, we had to have this coarse grain parallelism in our browser if we were going to keep up. And we do know now, although it took us a while to get there, it was a multi-year effort. We actually started testing our multi-process architecture in Firefox 48 with a small group of test users. But it wasn't until this past summer with Firefox 54 that we turned it on for all users. It took us a while to get there because we weren't starting fresh like Chrome was. We had a bit of a bumpier road. We were starting with this existing code base, which was developed before multi-core architectures were common. We needed to figure out how to break up this code base without breaking things for our users along the way. So we needed to make a plan for that. But we didn't just stop at making plans for coarse grain parallelism. We saw that we were going to need to take it further. Because when you have this coarse grain parallelism, there's a good chance you're still not making the best use of all of your cores. For example, you might have one tab that's doing a lot of work. But the others might not be doing much at all. So that means these other cores are sitting idle. And this means that you're not getting the kind of speed up that you can with a multi-core architecture. We saw that if we wanted to make a browser that was really fast, we couldn't just add this coarse grain parallelism. We needed to add fine grain parallelism, too. So what is fine grain parallelism? Well, that's when you take any one, when you take one of these big tasks and you split it up into smaller tasks, which can be more easily split up across the different cores that you have. But that does usually mean that you're going to have to share memory, as I was talking about before. And this opens you up to those data races, which are nearly impossible to avoid with shared memory, and they're incredibly tricky to debug. The thinking at the time was that to safely program in parallel, you basically had to have a wizard-level understanding of your language. One of the distinguished engineers at Mozilla actually put a sign about eight foot high saying, you must be this tall to write multi-threaded code. Now, of course, when you have a project like an open source browser with hundreds or thousands of contributors adding changes to your code base, you can't code in a way that requires a wizard level understanding of the language. If you do, you're going to run into these data races for sure. And these data races and other memory bugs cause some of the worst security vulnerabilities in browsers. So if we wanted to take advantage of this fine grain parallelism without the peril that these data races introduce, we couldn't just start hacking on a parallel version of the browser. We had to find a way to make it safe. So rather than starting a project to rewrite the browser, 
we started sponsoring a project to create a new language to write that new browser in. And that's the Rust programming language. As part of its design, it makes sure that these kinds of data races don't happen. If you had code that would result in one of these data races, it just won't compile. So we started sponsoring the work on Rust in 2009 or 2010. It wasn't until 2013 that we actually started putting it to use for a browser, though. We wanted to see whether or not it could create the kind of browser that we wanted. I don't know if you've heard of the term yak shaving, where you have to do one seemingly unrelated task before you can work on the task that you actually meant to work on. Well, at Mozilla, we have some pretty big yaks to shave. So in 2013, with this language in hand that allowed us to code in parallel without fear, we started looking at how we could really introduce fine-grained parallelism into the browser. The project that we created to do this is called Servo. It started by looking at this rendering engine pipeline and thinking, what if we parallelize all of the things? This means that we're not just sending the different content windows with different pages to different cores. We're taking a single content window and splitting up the different parts of that across the different cores. This means that if you have a site like Pinterest, each different pinned item can be processed separately from the others. So you could take the CSS style computation and have a core working on the CSS style computation for a different element. So this means that you can speed up the different parts of the rendering pipeline by however many cores you have. And this means that as chip manufacturers add more and more cores into the future, these pages are going to get faster and faster automatically. This is the key. This is why this fine-grained parallelism is so important. This is why we spent so much time and risked so much in pursuing it. Because it wasn't clear at the start of this project that it was actually going to work. Coarse-grained parallelism is pretty straightforward, but this fine-grained parallelism, actually coming up with a language to make it safe and then implementing a browser that used that, that was a tough research problem. But that time and effort has paid off. We found out that these ideas work and that they work really well. Over the past year, we've started bringing parts of Servo over to Firefox. We've been doing this as part of Project Quantum, which is a major speed up of Firefox that we've been working on for the last year. It's kind of been like replacing the parts of a jet engine mid-flight. And the first release of it is actually today. <laughs> One thing that we brought over is our parallel style engine called Stylo. This splits up all of the CSS processing across the different cores, like I was talking about before. It uses a technique called work stealing to split up that work. Whenever a core runs out of work, it can steal work from the other cores. And this makes splitting up work efficient. It makes it possible to speed up CSS style computation by however many CPU cores you have. Another piece that we're bringing over is called Web Render. WebRender takes the paint and composite stages and combines them together into a rendering stage. So it uses the hardware in a smart way to make painting the pixels faster, which means it can keep up with those larger displays. To do this, it uses another highly parallelized part of the computer, which is specifically meant for graphics. This is called the GPU, or the graphics processing unit. The cores on the GPU are a bit different from the cores on the CPU. Instead of having two or four or six of them like you would on the CPU, there are hundreds or thousands of them, but they can't work independently. You have to, they all have to be working on the same thing at the same time, which means that you have to be doing a lot of planning ahead of time to make sure that they are doing things the most efficient way. And that's what WebRender does. With WebRender, we can get rid of performance cliffs that trip up web developers. For example, if you animate background color right now, it can make your animation start and stop. It can make it look janky, because the paint and composite phase have to do too much work. And because of this, there are currently a lot of rules about what you should and shouldn't animate. But we're going to be able to get rid of a lot of those rules and make it so that developers don't have to hack around those performance cliffs. We can take pages that render in Chrome right now at 15 frames per second and bring them up to maximum FPS. Whether it's a <laughs> and we can do it whether that maximum FPS is 
60 FPS or 120 FPS. But it's not just the browser's own code that the browser is going to need to run faster. It's also going to need to run application code faster. Now, what I'm talking about here is JavaScript. The JavaScript engine is a part of the browser I haven't talked about yet, so let's see where this fits in. JavaScript gives you a way to change the document object model, that thing you built up during parsing. So that triggers the creation of a new version of the page. And a lot of the sites these days are pretty JavaScript heavy. That's where they spend a lot of the time, the 16 milliseconds they have. These sites are using frameworks like React, which does a lot of calculations in JavaScript to figure out what it needs to change in the DOM. Now, browsers can make these JavaScript engines faster. They can make it run the JavaScript faster. But JavaScript isn't really designed for machines to be able to run it quickly. It's designed for humans to be able to write it more easily. The way that JS engines get fast is by making guesses about where it can take shortcuts with your code. But sometimes those shortcuts don't work out. And there are only so many shortcuts that an engine can take. So there's only so much that the JS engines can do to make these applications run faster. But what if application code could also run in parallel? What if it could take advantage of the multiple cores in the same way that the browser's own code is doing? Over the past few years, browsers have been adding features that make this possible. One that you may have heard of is web workers, which have been in browsers for a few years now. These allow you to have JS code, which runs across different cores. You may also have heard of shared array buffers, which started landing in browsers this past summer. These give you that shared memory that I was talking about, which you often need for speed when you're working with fine-grained parallelism. But like I talk, talked about before, it's pretty tricky to actually manage that shared memory on your own. And web workers can be really hard to use, which is why so few sites and applications are using them today, even though they've been around for a number of years. It would be nice to have a language like Rust, which gives you those guarantees that you're not going to have data races and which makes it easy to split the work across different cores, across these different web workers. Well, there's actually another standard that landed in browsers this past year, which helps with this. WebAssembly makes it possible to run languages that aren't JavaScript in the browser. Now, it doesn't quite have access to the DOM yet. The working group's working on this. And they're also very close to finishing work on threading, which will make it possible to run WebAssembly across different cores efficiently. There are also other things about WebAssembly that help with application performance besides that, though. It was designed for machines to run it fast, not to be easy for humans to write, because usually a human is not going to have to write WebAssembly directly. Instead, they'll be writing in a language like Rust that compiles to WebAssembly. So that means that WebAssembly doesn't need to be easily readable by human programmers. It can be easy for the machine to read. And the, then the machine doesn't have to make those guesses about what shortcuts it can take. This speed of WebAssembly, even without threading, is what's making it possible to run PC games and browsers today. So these standards, web workers and shared array buffers and WebAssembly, they make it possible for applications to take advantage of parallelism too. For example, in a framework like React, you could actually rewrite the core reconciliation algorithm in parallel. And that way, the work of figuring out the difference between the previous version of an app and the next version could be distributed across your different cores. Ember is already starting to experiment with WebAssembly in their Glimmer VM. And they may be able to use some of these other standards as well. I think we're going to see a big shift towards using these standards in frameworks over the next few years. So let's get back to this challenge that we had. Here are the pieces of the puzzle. Here's how we address this challenge. This is what browsers need to do to support the new devices and new applications that are coming to the web. There's the core screen parallelism of splitting up the different content windows in Chrome across different processes. There's the fine grain parallelism of splitting up the work of a single web page so that can be distributed across the different cores. And then there's enabling application code to be parallelized as well. This core screen parallelism is already there in all of the browsers. Chrome was the first to do it, but pretty much all of the browsers have caught up at this point. Enabling application code to go parallel. That's something that's happening in standards bodies and is being adopted by all of the major browsers. 
is this fine grained parallelism that's still a question mark. This is where most browsers have done the least so far. And it's actually not clear how most browsers could do it. Because the C++ that most browsers are written in is actually pretty hard to parallelize in this way. But I think all of the browsers are going to need to do it. We may be the first browser to get there. We may be the first to get this fine grained parallelism in place and deliver these speed ups. But we really want all of the browsers to get there too. We want them to get there with us. Because that's how we're going to keep the web going. That's how we're going to keep it healthy and vibrant, no matter how much the limits are pushed. Thank you to JS Congress for having me. And thank you all for listening.